What do you mean? What do you mean? What do you mean? What do you mean? That's the name of the chat. The president addressed Netanyahu's use of the phrase from the river to the sea in their conversation today. I know the White House has previously said that phrase is divisive. So. Uh, I'm not aware that that specific phrase was discussed. Do you condemn him using that phrase? Uh, look, there's a, there's a connotation with that uh, f phrase. We talked about this before. Um, but when you know, when you use the phrase river to the sea, it, it speaks basically to the mantra of Hamas and in their manifesto where they basically describe the geographic bounds of what they believe to be Palestine. And if you look at it on the map, if you go look at the, the four corners that they describe it, it's basically the state of Israel. They just don't believe it should exist. So uh, again, it's it's not a phrase that um, uh, that we recommend uh, uh, using, given because of that context. But this wasn't Hamas. This was. Netanyahu. I understand. I, I don't have anything more on that, and I certainly don't have anything more on the conversation to read out with respect to that. So, in other words, um, you're asking me about uh, Netanyahu's aspirations to have no. Palestinians um, within uh, the river to the sea. And uh, I'm going to just talk about how Hamas's use of that phrase is problematic. Kind of sums it up. It's so embarrassing. It's so embarrassing. Emma is absolutely right. That is extremely embarrassing to have John Kirby, the national security spokesperson in the U.S., say the whole time, Anyone that says from the river to the sea, they could only mean that they want Israel wiped out. Is that okay, Mr. Kirby? Then what's the deal when Benjamin Netanyahu, the Prime Minister of Israel, says it? And just as a reminder of some of the controversy that came from this saying, Back in October. Censure Democratic Congressman Rashida Tlaib over her remarks related to the Israel-Hamas war. 22 Democrats joined Republicans to formally rebuke the only Palestinian American in Congress. The resolution accuses her of promoting false narratives surrounding Hamas's attack on Israel. It also cites her use of the phrase from the river to the sea, which is regarded as a call for the eradication of Israel as a Jewish state. She has defended that phrase, saying it is an aspirational call for freedom not death or destruction for Jewish people. They censured the only Palestinian American member of Congress. You had American people in the media and politicians trying to convince people that protesters saying from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free is somehow a call to wipe out Israelis. But when you have the understanding that people that are in the Gaza Strip can't just go to the West Bank, and you can't even just freely move around the West Bank. They have checkpoints and big walls and fences and guard towers and so it makes sense when you're calling for freedom for people that do not have any freedom and the only time i've heard anyone say from the river to the sea and it's made me think yep they are going to eradicate a group of people has been when benjamin netanyahu said it i need to include a clip from the five hour long video that i made if you haven't watched it you should go get started after this one it will take you a while do it in chunks i recommend but from November the 6th, I included a clip and I felt like it really needs a whole lot more discussion. Comments by a head of a settlement movement and I want to discuss it because of all of the controversy that seemed to come out of the phrase from the river to the sea. <laughs> There were weeks and weeks and weeks of discussion about what it means when a pro-Palestinian person says from the river to the sea, meaning the Jordan River and the Mediterranean Sea. 
I think it's time for the discussion of what does it mean when someone from Israel says from the Nile River to the Euphrates River because I don't know I don't know how Jordan and Syria and Lebanon and a chunk of Egypt and a chunk of Saudi Arabia and half of Iraq would feel about that is the USA gonna fund that as well and what do you know when you write those two rivers into a search engine together this comes up pretty quickly you have people going on Israeli TV saying from the Euphrates River to the Nile River never mind the Mediterranean Sea to the Jordan River and so let's go for a deeper dive I want to know more you want to know more we'll start with that woman that said it on TV all right first of all this movement the whole point of it is pretty much to settle Jewish people in what is commonly known as the West Bank and now reading this is how we found the rabbit hole we're about to dive down where it says she was raised in the ideology of the Lehi underground movement hmm down the rabbit hole we go so then naturally we find our way to the Lehi underground movement website and what have we got here? In considering the historical background of the establishment of the Lahomey Herut Israel movement, we must consider the four armed underground organizations which existed during British rule in the land of Israel. 1. Haganah 2. Haganah Lumet 3. Ergen Tuvai Lumi B Eretz Israel, but we are definitely just going to call that Etzel. And four, Loame Heret Israel, Lehi. The Haganah and Haganah Lumet preceded Etzel, also known as the Ergen, while Etzel preceded Lehi. Looks like it's time for a timeline, and it seems like a reasonable place to start for this will be World War One. And now I have to make a quick little side note. Since we're talking about World War One, I, I have to mention the Anzacs, and not just because we're talking about World War One, but we're talking about this particular part of the world, because that is where we had uh, Anzac Light Horse Brigades. Um, just wanted to make note of that, just because I'm Australian. And now back to the main point of this video. November the second, nineteen seventeen, addressed to Lord Lionel Walter Rothschild. I have much pleasure in conveying to you, on behalf of His Majesty's Government, the following declaration of sympathy with the Jewish Zionist aspirations which have been submitted to and approved by the Cabinet. His Majesty's Government view with favour the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people and will use their best endeavours to facilitate the achievement of this object. It being clearly understood that nothing shall be done which may prejudice the civil and religious rights of existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine or the rights and political status enjoyed by Jews in any other country. I should be grateful if you would bring this declaration to the knowledge of the Zionist Federation signed British Foreign Secretary Arthur James Balfour. And then we come to 1920 and this is when the Haganah, that's Hebrew for defense, was established. And this is also when the League of Nations established the British Mandate of Palestine. And you see, Britain already said to Arab Palestinians that they will get an independent state. But as you saw in the Balfour Declaration, which was incorporated into the British Mandate, they also promised a Jewish homeland to Zionists. And then, by 1923, Great Britain drew up borders going along the Jordan River and Dead Sea and gave what was east of the riverbank to the Hashemites and then we get to the start of the 1930s and we have the first Haganah split with Abraham Tahomi leaving the Haganah and starting the Haganah Lumet along with Zeev Jabotinsky and other people that also left and joined with them Abraham Yair Stern and David Raziel and then we get to 1933 and I'm including this very interesting article dated the 24th of August titled Zionist reject boycott of Reich. Just want to point out a few things like how it says mildness of resolution on the Nazis is believed designed to facilitate immigration. I'm not going to read the whole thing to you but I will include the link below if you'd like to read the whole thing yourself. And this sentence at the very end stood out to me how it says the resolution ends with a appeal to Jewish people to accept the view that Zionism is the only solution of the Jewish question. 
And the reason the Zionists would have rejected the boycott would have been because of companies like this. No way I'm going to say it correctly, but Hanatoa Zionist Citrus Company. See? Nazi report deal with Palestine. Germans tell of agreement for barter of their products for Jaffa oranges. Boycotter charges plot. Leader of the British anti-Hitler drive sees effort to ridicule the Jewish ban. Dated the 28th of August. So a couple of days after the last article I included. And it's Starts. A remarkable announcement by the German Land Trade League, published in newspapers here today, would indicate, if correct, that the much heralded Jewish boycott of German goods has certain qualifications. And then it goes on to list some of the items, and everything should be in the description box below if you'd like to read anything yourself. And now this leads us to another company known as Havara. And what these companies pretty much did would take the money from German Jews that wanted to immigrate to Palestine, use that money to buy German goods and then ship both the goods and the people to Palestine where the goods are then sold by the company and the proceeds are given to the immigrant. I find this fascinating how Jews from all over the world were boycotting Nazi Germany and then Zionists weakened the boycott but to save Jews from Germany. I believe 60,000 German Jews moved from Germany to Palestine in the time of this company existing. Very fascinating and I have to also include this medallion or coin from 1934 it translates to a Nazi goes to Palestine and writes about it in the attack which was a Nazi publication at the time all right and now moving on to 1936 where Abraham Tahomi decides to go back to the Haganah leaving Stern, Reziel and Jabronski behind and this is when you get Etzel. And now Etzel rejected the policy of Havlaga, meaning restraint in Hebrew. So they disagreed with the Haganah's policy of just defending yourself, meaning Etzel wanted to attack. And now I just want to take a moment to have a good look at the symbol. Take a good look at it. This is why I made a point of showing the map of the British Mandate before they divided up Palestine and Transjordan, because you can see it, right? Here's one of their posters, just to really make it clear. And then starting November 9th, 1938, what's been called Crystal Nuck, meaning the night of broken glass, where pretty much every synagogue in Germany was destroyed by arson and Jewish businesses, Jewish people's homes, people were killed. And then because of this event and some speeches Hitler made and other events, this forced other countries to have to impose some economic consequences on Nazi Germany. As we can see from this article from the 18th of February 1939, titled Reich Exports Cut 12.5% in one month. Full damage inflicted on the nation's trade by excesses shown in January figures. Drop in imports is 13.5%. The full damage inflicted on Germany's foreign trade by the anti-Semitic excesses last November was revealed today with the publication of the January foreign trade figures. And then we get to May 1939 and what is commonly known as the British White Papers, which they went to limit Jewish immigration to Palestine, stating that there is a limit of 75,000 immigrants over the next five years, with 10,000 each year after 25,000 in the initial year. And this was one of the driving reasons for why the British were now seen as an enemy by the Jewish people in Palestine. And then September 1st, 1939, World War II breaks out. And then in 1940, we finally get to the part where Stern splits from Etzel to start Lehi. Their leader, Jabonski, tries to stop it, but obviously doesn't, especially once he passes away shortly after. And so then David Raziel is the leader of Etzel. Stern is the leader of Lehi. And what was the main cause of the split? What couldn't they see eye to eye on? Well, Etzel wanted an alliance with the British for the duration of the war against Nazi Germany, where Stern didn't agree with that. He wanted to continue to fight the British regardless of the war against Nazi Germany. And now I'd like to read part of the Lehi website for you where it details some of the history. Another incident was the attempt by Yeh and his associates to forge ties with Nazi Germany at the height of World War II. In early 1941, it became clear from information coming from Europe and published in the press that the situation for the Jews in Europe, much of which was occupied by Nazi Germany, was especially critical. Their rights were violated, they were fired from their jobs, their property was confiscated, they were evicted from their homes, they were imprisoned in ghettos, they had to put on yellow stars, 
but there still was not a feeling of impending doom. In fact, the final solution was a decision reached only at the Wansi Conference in early 1942. Interesting. Keep that in mind as I read the next part and give you more information. Yeah believed that after Hitler captured Poland, he would want to banish the Jews from it, but he would not know what to do with them. To imprison them in ghettos or transfer them to Madagascar? We must speak with the Germans, he would say time again. He continued, It is clear that if we cannot reach an accord with the Germans, the Jews of Europe will be exterminated. We must analyse the problem carefully. Who are our enemies? What good is the war to us, and whom is it worth it to fight for the liberation of our land, for the salvation of our land, for the salvation of millions in Europe? It is clear to me the enemy is Britain. Saving millions was within its grasp, but she did not do it. On the contrary, she insisted on their extermination, the Arab dominion in the land, which is the British dominion. There is not much worth in our helping the Allies. What good does it do us? Less than zero. That is why the only option left is for us to reach an agreement with the Germans to save the Jews of Europe by transferring them to Eretz Israel. Germany will do this in exchange for our war with the British. We cannot declare war against Germany while the Jewish people is prisoner in German's hands. Wow. And now I just want to point something out about these two paragraphs, how the first one says there wasn't a feeling of impending doom yet, and in fact the final solution was a decision reached only at the Warren Sea Conference in early 1942, and that was on the 20th of January 1942. And then it goes on to say that Stern would say time and time again that it is clear that if they do not reach an accord with the German, Jews of Europe will be exterminated. But you see, Stern was killed in February of 1942. So I just want to point out how that seems like a contradiction to me. How can you not have a sense of impending doom, but be saying time and time again about the extermination? of European Jews, but yet this was only a decision made a couple weeks before the person who reportedly said these things was killed. It doesn't quite add up. Just wanted to point that out. And this is all really incredible. I did not realise this was where that rabbit hole was going to lead us. Okay, and with David Raziel being killed in 1941 and Abraham Stern being killed in 1942, Etzel and Lehe both need leadership and eventually, around 1943, Etzel ends up with Menachem. Nahem begin and Lehi ends up with Yitzhak Shamir. Some other notable things done by Etzel and Lehi are a lot of assassinations of various people and a big one was on the 29th of June 1946 was the King David Hotel bombing. The King David Hotel itself. It was in the wing on the right of the picture that the terrorists placed their explosive. And the result of the crime, the tragic scene, is like a serious incident during the Blitz. The hotel housed the British Army headquarters and the Palestine government offices, and casualties were very heavy. 65 deaths are reported, and there is little or no hope of survival for any of the 58 missing. Nearly 50 others were injured. The Jewish terrorist organization, Irgun Zwei Leomi, openly admitted responsibility for the bombing. And then on the 9th of April, 1948, what's come to be known as the Dear Yassan Massacre, and to give you more information about that, I found a clip by an Israeli historian, Benny Morris, and then a witness of the event, a Palestinian victim and then another witness being a former Israeli soldier.
Maria Makil is 85 years old. She was born in Deir Yassin village and survived the massacre committed by far-right Jewish underground forces. But six members of her family were executed, including her mom and dad. Maryam says it was her brother who raised the alarm to the 600 residents and the Jews stormed the village on April the 9th, 1948. My brother was tall, but he was 16 years old. Because he was tall, he looked older. Jews entered my sister's house and took my brother and asked him how many Jews he killed in the Battle of Kessel. My sister told the Jew he was a student, but the Jew wanted to shoot him. So my sister wanted to bribe him to save my brother's life. The Jew accepted the money and he pushed my brother to the ground and put five bullets in his head. By the end of the day, 107 Palestinians living in the village had been killed, including many women and children. And you see, while this massacre was happening, Lehi contacted Albert Einstein seeking funds. And this is Albert Einstein's response. Dear sir, when a real and final catastrophe should befall us in Palestine, the first responsible for it will be the British, and the second responsible for it, the terrorist organizations built up from our own ranks. I am not willing to see anybody associated with those misled and criminal people. Sincerely yours, Albert Einstein. And the last piece of information I want to include in this video to go back to the former leaders of Etzel and Lehi. Well, Menachem Begin went on to be the sixth Prime Minister of Israel and Yitzhak Shamir went on to be the seventh Prime Minister of Israel. Thanks for watching. We'll wrap it up here because yeah, this was an interesting one to make. It really just started with that rabbit hole. Started with the woman who was quoting Genesis chapter 15 verse 18 and that's what she's basing it all off of from the Euphrates River to the Nile River and she was raised in the ideology of an underground movement which was a terrorist group and so whenever I hear Israeli leaders talk about Palestinians being terrorists or talk about Nazis all of this information is going to be in the back of my mind because I didn't know this I don't know if I would have found this out without going down this rabbit hole so I thank you for joining me and I'll see you next time what do you mean with a an exclamation point